Today, it's my great pleasure to introduce Darren Pleasance. Darren leads Google's global customer acquisitions team, which is a team of about 1,700 members spread across 32 countries. His team is focused on helping companies use Google's advertising services to grow their businesses. His team works with companies from various industries and teach them how to harness the power of search, display advertising, and YouTube to attract, grow, and retain their customers. Prior to joining Google, Darren was a partner at McKinsey & Company in their North American uh, practice, marketing and sales practice, and the founder and co-leader of McKinsey's global small and medium business practice. Prior to this role, Darren spent 10 years as a professional pilot in California and Alaska, and also helped uh, launch and grow several small companies. In fact, Darren still continues to fly for fun today, and as an anecdote, he was a pilot of John Travolta. He, uh, he's a Bruin, he's a local, he earned his MBA uh, from UCLA Anderson. Today he's going to share his vision about how businesses can harness the power of digital. So without any further ado, please join me in welcoming Darren Pleasance. Thank you, Guillaume. Thank Appreciate you. it. Thank you very much. Thank you, everybody. Can you all hear me okay back there? Awesome. Um, so first, super exciting to be here. I, uh, it's my first time presenting at the, at the school here. I, I kind of want to call it the new school, but it's actually been here for quite a while. But I was, uh, as was alluded to earlier, I was part of the older generation. I, was, uh, I graduated here in 95, so it's been a while ago. And when I joined, we were in the kind of Soviet-style cinder block building on the other side of the campus. And I remember arriving on the first day, and they talked about this new school being built. And they even walked us by. And this was a big hole in the ground with some buildings starting to go up. And they said, we'll have you in there next year. So first year in the old building, second year in the new building. And then we got there the second year. And it's like, well, it won't be first quarter, but second quarter, you'll be in the new building. And then second quarter came and went. And then it was third quarter, you'll get to graduate. That came and went. So the very end, we graduated on the other side of campus. And they walked us over here. And they put us out in front of the steps out here. And they got a picture of us with the new building. So. That was our introduction to the new building, so it's, uh, it's great to see how well it's turned out, and it's, it's certainly fu very, very fun to come back. It's, uh, it's really a great school. Um, so I have a lot to talk about today. I thought I would start by a bit of background on myself, mainly because it'll be relevant towards the end of the talk. I do want to spend a bit of time talking about just some of the things I've learned along my, uh, my career. Uh, this is a shot when I used to be when I did the Alaska flying. That's up on the Hilton Glacier. It's called up on Mount McKinley when I used to do the bush flying. Um, let me tell you a bit more about me. So you heard about the flying stuff. It's really a golden thread through my whole life. I started when I was 13 years old. I, I got my, uh, I soloed when I was 16. I got my private at 17, commercial instrument, flight instructor at 18, and then basically became a flight instructor and taught my way through school. I was up in Santa Barbara getting my degree in mechanical engineering, and over the years managed to fly a lot of different airplanes. I was an aerobatic instructor. I flew old World War II fighter planes, I flew jets, I did the John Travolta flying, I also flew for a venture capital firm. And, uh, and it was that venture capital experience where I went from being a pilot to migrating basically into the office. That when I wasn't flying, uh, I was reviewing purchase contracts, I was building cash flow analyses, trying to help the CFO do business valuation work. And I didn't know anything about it, so this was me learning over a period of six years. So fly sometimes, do business stuff. Uh, so it was a wonderful experience. Uh, at which time I decided that I should formalize this business experience and I applied to Anderson and I got in and I came here for two years. Shortly after that, I managed to work my way into McKinsey. There's a slightly longer story, but I ended up at McKinsey after graduate school. I thought I would go there for two years and uh, ended up being there for 15. And so I made partner, I ended up founding a few practices and um, it was a wonderful experience. Traveled the world, learned a lot of different things. One of the main things I was doing there was uh, helping large companies learn how to sell to small and mid-sized businesses. And it turned out that I got a call about four years ago from Google saying, hey, we have a new global role opening up to lead a global sales team that focuses on helping small and mid-sized companies learn how to use Google's advertising services, AdWords. And so I got, uh, got hired by Google, that's my daughter Lauren. And, um, and it was interesting because I was living in Oregon at the time. I had been based in McKinsey in the Palo Alto office, but about um, six years ago, I guess, or so, 
I was commuting all over the world, and one of the things I realized with consulting is since you're never home, you can live anywhere. And so I chose to live in Bend, Oregon, which is a beautiful part of the world. It's kind of the aspen of, or of, of Oregon, basically. It's a ski town, and I just wanted the kids to have that opportunity to grow up in that kind of environment. And so the last part of my negotiation with Google was that I would get to stay there, and I would just commute, either commute down to Mountain View or to wherever the team was that I had to visit. And so, um, so I have a small plane, and I can fly down on Monday mornings, and I fly home typically Thursday afternoon. So for me, it's living the dream. I get to still fly every week, uh, and I get to work at what I think is the most amazing company in the world. Google is just fantastic. So what do I do? I think I talked about this already, or it was in my intro. I basically am responsible for bringing new customers into Google. We bring in several million customers a year into Google. These are companies that don't yet use the internet to do online advertising. And I'll talk a bit more about that, uh, what that is. Um, but then once they start doing online advertising, uh, I own the first 90 days and they move downstream to an account management team. So it gives me a chance to work with marketing, the various sales teams that I've got, the engineering teams. Um, this world of big data, we use an incredibly large amount of big data to do a lot of the modeling we do to do customer acquisition. So it's been a, a real dream to take everything I learned at McKinsey and apply it in a very real uh, global scale. Um, we could spend hours talking about the stuff I'm going to talk about here, so we don't have hours. So I'm going to do a, a flyby on some things that I think you'll all find interesting. My goal is to hopefully entertain you a bit. There's some fun stuff in here. I hope I educate you, I teach you a few things. Uh, I hope I give you a few provocative thoughts to take with you as well about something that can help you as you embark from from Anderson and head back into the world. Uh, I'm not, I know not everybody here is a student. What's, how many of you are students here? Okay, so the majority. So I know some of you are not embarking into a new career. You're going to go back to your current career after this session. And I hopefully, hopefully will leave you with a few uh, insights as well. So I'm going to talk about trends, implications for business, and then the words of wisdom is really just my, my views on life. So you can take them or leave them. All right, so some of the key trends. We live in an incredibly connected world. Right? If you think about how fast the explosion of these devices, you know, the iPhone came out in 2007, how fast the explosion of these mobile devices has, it's really taken over the world. And if you look here, right, just a little over a year ago, basically six billion of these devices, and just another year and a half or so, we'll have roughly 10 billion of these, more devices than there are people on the earth. Right? So this is becoming pervasive. And what's interesting is it's not just mobile devices, it's everything becoming connected. So whether it's your car, whether it's your appliances, whether it's your thermostat, even toothbrush. Right? You can download an app, Oral-B Toothbrush, and you can keep track of either yours or your kids' toothbrushing, teeth brushing habits and use that to track how well you're doing at that. Right? And so this is becoming a world where everything is connected. And it's a world where we're living in, uh, where all that data is now being created and largely uploaded into the cloud. Right? And the cloud is giving us essentially unlimited storage and unlimited access to supercomputing power that never existed. Even just a few short years ago, that didn't exist. And that's giving us the ability to drive insights and generate, um, help drive decisions basically in ways that we never could before. So one of the main things that's happening is technology is changing. Right? It used to be that technology was a bit of a um, you ask for something, it gives it back. You go to the Google search engine, you type something in, it gives you an answer back. Right? It's now changing where all this data that's being collected is being used to help drive more of an assist model where it anticipates and then assists us with our daily lives. So you can take the self-driving car, for instance. Right? It, is, it is using hundreds of sensors to look out into the world, look at what's happening around it, and then use the big data that's behind the machine there to anticipate what's coming. It's got a bicycle riding down the road. It sees cones way up ahead. It knows that there's a high probability that bike will turn left and go around those cones. Right? It's not waiting to see that bike turn and then react. It's anticipating. Or this is a Google contact lens over here. It measures um, uh, blood glucose, glucose levels. So as opposed to having to prick your finger periodically to test glucose levels, it does real-time ongoing monitoring. And so it will send a signal to your smartphone in this case and tell you when, when the, uh, the balance is getting out of whack. And so again, anticipating as opposed to waiting for you to take an action and then read a result. Um, this is seen, I don't know how many of you have ever used like Google Now, just on a, on a phone here, but it's basically out there in the background looking at emails, looking at your calendar, looking at weather, looking at traffic, kind of the world around you. And given how personal this device is, it knows what you are likely to be doing. So it'll know if I have a meeting in, uh, you know, in, in Long Beach, 
and it's supposed to be an hour after I finish speaking here, but it notices there's a traffic accident on the 405 and or weather issue, I'll get a notification that says leave 15 minutes early, right? It just does that in the background. And that's part of the power of what this world of connected devices is beginning to enable. It's, a, it's a, basically an anticipatory technology environment that's never existed before. And so the, the number of devices that we are expecting to see out there is expected to grow by about seven or eight fold up to about 80 billion devices out there. So when I say device, I don't mean just that. I mean all the other stuff I showed on that last slide, whether it's cars or, or smart um, thermostats or whatnot. So it's, it's going to dramatically change the way our lives operate on a day-to-day -day basis. And it allows for a bunch of interesting experiences too. Right, this is Google Photos. Who, who here uses Google Photos? So it's probably, maybe it's a third or so. It's free, but to me this has been a, a dramatically improved experience when it comes to photos, because all of us take hundreds of photos over the course of any given week. And in fact, there's about a billion and a half photos being uploaded every week right now to Google. And what happens is we're able to use machine learning to start doing all the meta tagging on the pictures in ways that most of us would never do. Half the time we lose our pictures and we try to remember where we were and when we were more likely so we can go back through thousands of pictures trying to find it. Well, what this does is it starts to notice similarities between pictures across the world and starts to categorize them automatically. So I can go in, this is from my Google photo shot, and I just typed in horse. Right? It goes back through every picture I've ever taken and it knows what a horse looks like. Doesn't matter if it's a horse laying down in the mud or a horse jumping like my wife down in the bottom corner or my daughter's herding cattle. It knows what a horse looks like. And so I can search for anything I want without having to ever keep track of when I took the picture, where I was, what I was doing. And so it adds a level of intelligence on top that really changes how useful photo applications are. So that's a pretty simple one. Um, this I think is, is transformative, right? This is Google Translate. Um, we are doing this now in 90 languages. There's about a billion translations a day uh, on computers. So you can type in a word, of course, it'll spit it back in one of 90 different languages. And what's really fundamentally changing now is visual translation. So you take your phone, you take a picture as it shows here of a, of a sign, an instant translation. We've got this in 27 languages now. And this is basically the power of what's sitting in the internet, essentially, up in the cloud, is this ability to do these rapid translations and deliver a set of services to you, to all of us, that were never possible before. Even more transformative, I think, on a, on a human level is education, right? That the ability to transform how we experience the world in education is changing in front of our eyes. This is an example of Google Cardboard. Uh, Facebook's got Oculus. You know, the Cardboard version is, is basically a very low cost version of virtual reality that you can put your phone in and it gives you a three-dimensional experience. And this is uh, Google Expeditions. And so here you can go into a classroom and the teacher has a tablet and we can say, let's go to Egypt today. And boom, instantly all the kids are in Egypt and they're looking around and the teacher can guide them. They'll take a look at this pyramid over here or, or these artifacts over here and the kid is totally immersed. And so what a different kind of learning experience than simply flipping through a book or, or watching more of a one-dimensional video. And you can imagine this changing a lot more things than just education. Uh, in the interest of time, I'm not going to show the next video, but um, the next video is basically a, a medical version of this where they, uh, a young girl, this was shown on CNN just a few weeks ago, a young girl had half of her heart missing when she was born and they were able to upload the 3D images. The doctors were, they thought she was inoperable, but because of being able to look at the heart in three dimensions, they were able to find a way to save her, basically. And it's a really neat application of how this whole world of virtual and augmented reality is going to change how we do a lot of things. One thing that came to mind the other day that I saw, I went to the Warriors game uh, for their 73rd win and was watching and the most expensive seat in the stadium went for $17,000 right down on the front court there. And you know, rather than one person getting it for 17,000, what if 5,000 people got it for $50, right? Way more money to the Warriors and you could have your virtual reality thing on your headset and basically experience the game from anywhere in the world as though you were there. You'd have the same three-dimensional view and the same sound, the same everything. So can, you can imagine it transforming a lot of things that we do where you've got limited, limited capacity. Uh, this is, that's the video. It's worth going to YouTube. You just type in, uh, you know, uh, type in Google Cardboard Saves Baby and you'll find it. It's a neat video. So all these trends around a connected world are fundamentally changing how we as consumers operate. And let me just bring a few of those to life, see if these resonate with you. So one is a desire for instant gratification. I think it probably started with FedEx years ago. Now you've got Amazon Prime. More and more we want it and we want it now. Google search is another good example, right? You used to have to go do research to get answers to a question. Now if you don't get it within 0.13 seconds, right, you're a little bit frustrated. 
And so we as a society become increasingly um, short in our expectations of how quickly we can get something. It's fundamentally changing our own expectations of what, what businesses deliver to us. Infinite choice, right? We want to be able to have what we want when we want it. I think this is a great example here. This is, um, this is in Korea in the Seoul subway station. Um, and this is uh, Tesco is doing this. And basically what it is, it's a, a digital display of a grocery store. And so they can update stuff instantly because there's no real products. And as you're waiting for your subway car to come by, you can take pictures of what you want and it gets delivered to your house. And so talk about you know, zero real estate footprint, uh, zero wastage when it comes to inventory and ultimate variety, right? And so this is, a, I think, an awesome example of where digital and, and physical come together. Informed and aware, right? None of us buy anything without being aware and informed on what we're going to buy. And so whether it's the, the likes of Yelp or Angie's List helping us make a decision or whether it's just going on a, a search engine and searching for information on a product, all of us will have done that homework before we go in to buy. And so we have a consumer out there, including all of us, who walk into virtually every purchase decision with a lot more information than we've ever had before. In fact, it, about 10% of sales, last number I saw, happen online, uh, which means a lot is happening offline, but 50% of offline sales are influenced by online. So online is playing a huge role in shaping our perceptions and shaping our uh, views on what it is we're likely to go buy. And in fact, people really don't go to the physical store anymore to shop. They mostly do shopping here, they do buying at the physical store. And so the two are very symbiotic with each other. And then experts everywhere. This is the idea that experts used to be really defined by some level of either, um, uh, either training or celebrity that sort of ornated somebody as a celebrity or as, a, as an expert in, the, in society. And it's changed a lot now. Now it's much more about relatedness and authenticity and this, is, this woman is Michelle Fan. She's a young gal that started off giving uh, makeup tips to young women several years ago and ended up building a massive following on YouTube. She's got almost a billion views of her YouTube video, just under a billion views. She's got seven million subscribers to her YouTube channel, 500,000 Twitter followers. Just with YouTube, she was making several million dollars a year. She then got picked up by Lancome because she had such an influence over young women and now increasingly older women around makeup tips. And you've got hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of these people in different categories who basically built their own brand and are seen as much more the expert in the world than any famous person any of us would have seen on TV or more traditional media. So it's really transforming how this works. I got a, a fun video I will run about how a young man in Africa used the power of YouTube in this case and the expertise available on YouTube to transform his life. So maybe one time very few will be learning three videos. 
I think just a super cool example. I guess he's favored to win gold at, uh, at Rio now too. But uh, you know, there's thousands and probably millions of people like that, right? That go out and can learn something like he's done. My son's a perfect example. He's built his own video business. He's 17 years old, but everything he learned was on YouTube. And so the, the power of education through the technology that's available today has now become largely ubiquitous. And places where it's not available, that's a big mission of Google is to try to make the internet available to everybody in order to enable more of those types of stories. So um, pretty cool. So. If, if that's what's happening with all of us, right, if, our, if we're expecting infinite choice and we're expecting it now and we're much more informed and aware than we've ever been before, what does that mean for businesses? For those of us that either work in a business or will work in a business and inform businesses, what does that mean for businesses? And so a set of questions I think it provokes. One is, is our leadership adapting fast enough? Uh, one of the realities out there is that you know, there, there is this emergence, more and more consumers today, are digital natives, right? They're people who've grown up without ever knowing the world without the internet. And part of the challenge, and I saw this certainly through my years at McKinsey, is most of the businesses out there today are run by, at best, digital migrants, right? People who kind of understand that technology matters and they've done their best to, to learn it, but at best it's like a second language, and so they're somewhat conversant but not very fluid in it. And the reality is it's, it's the digital natives who are really at the forefront of all of this technology change that I've just described. And they're the ones who are really playing the lead and shaping how the world evolves around us. I think this is a great example. This uh, gal's name is uh, Brittany Wegner. She was 17 years old. She won the Google Science Fair a couple of years ago. And I have a short video here I just think is super inspiring, but just brings to life the, the kinds of people that are emerging into the workforce driven by technology. Since I was 15, my cousin was diagnosed with breast cancer. And I saw firsthand the impact it has on women's I decided I wanted to make a difference by trying to make the experience a little bit better for those involved. I was able to teach the computer how to diagnose breast cancer by making it think like the brain to detect patterns far too complex for humans to recognize. This music can determine if a breast mass is malignant or benign. It's really important because the least invasive test for breast cancer is also the least conclusive. Most doctors should choose to use these biopsies. If they could be used, it could lead to earlier detection and a better process for the patient. I spent hundreds upon hundreds of hours researching for over two years, creating a neural network tool for doctors to use when analyzing results. When the application actually diagnosed masses successfully, it was very exciting. It diagnoses over 99% of cancer patients correctly. And since it is deployed as a cloud service, it has the potential to be accessed by any hospital in the world. It has been amazing to see how people including cancer survivors, are responding to my program and its potential. Cancer touches all of us, and unfortunately, the rates are rising. Helping find the cure to cancer is a real goal of mine, and one day, I would love to be working on breakthroughs that can save lives. I think the main implication of that is if you're involved in a business, being extra attentive to bringing in people like Brittany, bringing people who are comfortable with the technology that's shaping the world around us. And frankly, many of the companies I worked with at McKinsey were not doing that, right? They had kind of become insular and valued a lot more years and years of experience than they did some of the uh, just innate understanding of the technology around us. So absolutely investing in people like Brittany makes a big difference in, in your ability as a company to innovate. Uh, another question, right? Are we reimagining our business? This really comes down to are we thinking through what the implications of these technologies could or should be on our business and using those to drive real hard decisions to transform how we operate, right? Every one of these businesses, whether it's Square in financial services, Uber in transportation services, Airbnb in hospitality services, have taken advantage of the technology that we've just talked about to fundamentally transform that part of the industry that they're operating in. And so it raises real questions. Every company should be looking at this and saying, how do we adapt, right? And how do we transform? And, it really can't be incremental. One of the big things that, that, that Google's very focused on and has been since Larry and Sergey founded it years ago is around this concept of 10x and trying not to just be incremental in our improvements, but trying to really think about transforming and, and basically being the first ones to outcompete ourselves as much as we can and take advantage of the technology that's out there to really deliver on the mission of the business. And so I think in our case, asking ourselves in the, whatever business you're in, are we thinking about these technologies in a way that could fundamentally transform how we deliver the service we deliver or the product we deliver? 
Um, and then are we creating a frictionless experience? I'll use Amazon. I think they're probably one of the best out there, right? We've all gotten used not just to Amazon Prime, but the whole buying experience. They've really done a great job end to end of making that experience feel great. And unfortunately, too many companies basically show their org structure to the world. They've got marketing, it does its thing, sales does its thing, service does its thing, and in many cases, product is disconnected too. And so if you're trying to get something delivered, particularly if it involves working with third parties outside of the company, you end up with a pretty bad experience in many cases. And so there's a real push that says, can we take advantage of this technology now to deliver a completely seamless experience end to end where the customer is basically pulled into it in a way that wants to have them keep going? This is a great example here with Sungevity. Um, where you know, they send an email, you, if you get the email, you click on the email, it takes you to a Google Earth photo of your house with, a, with an overlay of what solar panels would look like on top with their estimate, given where they know the latitude and the trees around your house. You know, what would the savings likely be? You can click and go straight into a video conference with someone who's looking at the same page. They'll then send you an email with people nearby who've bought from them, who've agreed to serve as references for you. And then once you sign up and get going, they, their web page immediately converts to one that basically tracks the progress of the installation. So when will the installer be there? And you can see exactly where it is. And then once you're up and going, you get notifications on how much energy you've saved. And they've just completely thought this whole process end to end, both inside their company and outside with the third parties they work for. And so using these technologies I've talked about to think about your own business and how can you construct a experience to customers that truly is end to end. So I want to do a little bit of a deep dive on marketing because, of course, everything I've talked about is in business in general, but uh, I do work on the AdWords side. So I want to do a, a little bit of a deep dive into, into marketing since I suspect a number of you will, either through consulting or if you go into pretty much any company, you've got marketing to, uh, to contend with, and there's a lot changing in the world of marketing. So this was marketing you know, 50 years ago, sitting around the television. You could, uh, on, a, on a busy night, you can get 70% of households to tune into an I Love Lucy or something. And that's, you know, of course, fundamentally changed, right? This, this definitely looks like, like my house. Television, laptop, uh, phone, tablet, all going at the same time. And so it is now absolutely a multi-screen world that we live in, which creates huge challenges to marketers who are trying to reach various audiences and have struggled to do that historically. And all of us are certainly consuming and creating, right? Three billion searches a day, 100 hours of video uploaded every minute to YouTube. Think about that, that's a massive amount of content. When I joined Google just four years ago, that number was 40. So it's jumped from 40 to 100 hours a minute of video being uploaded. Um, people are engaging and they're learning all of what we just talked about. Even businesses, a lot of people see these stats and think it's about consumer, but businesses, small businesses, don't just make, uh, don't, don't use traditional approaches as much anymore like maybe a, um, a trade show or something equivalent or advertising in a trade magazine. They are going online, doing their research before they're buying in even a business-to-business -business context. So this is as relevant for consumers as it is for businesses. And this is why I have a job, right? That stat right there. Less than 10% of businesses today around the world advertise online. And even in, in countries like the US and the UK, which are pretty advanced when it comes to digital marketing, that number is far less than 50%. So there is huge opportunity out there for companies to learn how to take advantage of the power that the internet provides and digital marketing provides to reach customers. And I'll give you a, a short video. This fellow's name is Roberto, and it's just a neat story. I'll let the video speak for itself, but he discovered online marketing in a really cool way. Inspiration has many sources, and I bring a lot of things from my childhood. I like drawing, I like uh, creating things, and then seeing them build. That's something I enjoy since I was a kid. My name is Roberto Gil. My business is Casa Kids. When I started doing furniture, I wasn't doing so much of my own designs because before the web, I didn't know how to reach customers. So I was doing work for architects and interior designers, and it wasn't what I wanted to do. AdWords has completely changed my business. Now, people look for children's furniture and they find me. And if you're smart picking the words, they're gonna find you quicker. When I started using AdWords, the traffic in my website went up like right away and increased sales by more than 30%. 
That's like 10 extra bunk beds and, and a lot more kids enjoying our furniture. Now I work directly with customers and I'm giving kids rooms that they enjoy, that they love. And I know how to market my products in a way that you can quantify the results. I know the company will keep growing. It wasn't always easy, but it's important to have aspirations and dreams. And the web has made my dream come true. I feel I'm just starting. I get hundreds of those kinds of examples a month. So that's part of why I'm at Google is I get these amazing stories of people who take what might have otherwise been a hobby and turn it into a business. And it's because of the ability to reach basically at a global scale whatever customers are trying to reach for their product or service. So it's, it's really been a powerful way for companies to grow. And at Google, we, we certainly think of it as a way to augment traditional media. We don't think that TV, radio, print, and those, uh, those traditional media go away. We just think this becomes a very powerful accelerator to the power of marketing. A Couple of big things to make sure you take away today. Mobile, mobile, mobile. It is all about mobile. The amount of time people spend on this versus their desktop has shifted dramatically. And what these two lines, the top yellow one there is, is time spent on a device consuming content, and the bottom one is time spent on a desktop. And so you can see those lines diverging pretty dramatically. So if you're not building a business and thinking about what that experience has got to be when they engage with your company on a mobile device, you're missing out on a huge opportunity. And you can do, whether it's search, Display is basically like essentially banner ads, if you will, but there's much more interactive versions as people are shopping or, or reading online. That's display advertising and video is basically, you've all been on YouTube, I'm sure, and seen, uh, uh, and, and Facebook's got their, uh, their rolled videos as well. And these are the three main ways people engage with company or customers in a, in a digital marketing world. And we could spend a lot of time just on that. I'll take questions on it in a little while if you have more specific questions. Um, what's interesting about it is, is digital marketing started it's more of a direct response thing. Somebody searches for something, you know, whatever, uh, rain boots, rain boots pops up, you can buy it, that's it. And what's really happening, especially with the power of video, is it's also shifting up the customer funnel to more the awareness and consideration side of the funnel. How, how many have seen this? this is Jean-Claude Van Damme on, the, uh, on the, uh, the Volvo truck one, right? So this is, a, in a sense, a B2B example, right? He's basically, Volvo was not trying to sell any of us in this room a truck, um, but it got a lot of views. Right, and almost, almost 70 million views, so a huge amount of engagement, like real engagement, right? For a whole month, <laughs> people searching for Volvo trucks more than they were searching related to sex. So <laughs> this is a very powerful medium that gets a lot, a lot of interest. And what I find fascinating about this is it's really driving innovation in how companies think about doing online marketing. Like if most of you have seen YouTube and you have the five seconds, we call it Truvu, you can skip the ad. Um, Geico did a really cool thing. We won't watch the whole video, but the first part's quite funny. They recognize that they need to capture someone's attention quickly. Don't thank me. Thank the savings. You can't skip this Geico ad because it's already over. Geico. 15 minutes could save you 15% or more on car insurance. And I'm going to move forward because you guys can go watch this if you want because it's like a, a minute. It's got over 7 million views. It's amazing. It, it's a really funny one. And they did a whole series of those. Last one, you don't have to have a lot of money. This one, this video was produced, um, just cost a few thousand dollars, produced by a guy who was trying to sell his old piece of junk car in Australia. I'll let you watch the video quickly and then uh, I'll tell you about it. That's actually the owner of the car. So he did the hack, he did the Twitter thing, he did everything basically, all the social media you can do. Um, it got 5 million views, it sold for $30,000, the thing was probably worth about $1,500. <laughs> it sold for $30,000, he donated the, um, the 
the proceeds to cancer research, so he got rid of the money. Um, and then the, car, the company that bought it was an insurance company that used it for crash testing. And then they had a follow-up to that. People wanted to watch that car being crashed, so it was great promotional <laughs> stuff for the insurance. So my main point on that is you don't have to spend a lot of money. That was a few thousand dollars, and you got millions of hits. So it just shows the power of, of online marketing. Um, last point on this, then I'm going to shift, and I want to make sure I leave time for questions here. One thing to remember, I think, I think Lorraine Tuhill runs marketing at Google, has done, I think, a brilliant job of this, is that you know, at the end of the day, really what marketing is about is around connecting with people in an emotional way that drives action. And it's really easy in today's world, especially with online marketing, to get caught up in the science of marketing, all the data and, and all the and, and Alex, analytics that you can do. And that's a hugely powerful capability, especially of digital marketing. But at the end of the day, it's around putting out content that's relevant, that's interesting, that inspires action. And so um, I definitely want to make sure that you don't, you don't err too, too far on one side versus the other. Both of those together is where the real power is uh, of marketing. So a couple quick takeaways, and I want to end on, on one final slide here. Um, we live in a connected world, right? Everything is connected. Just think as you go out today, pretty much everything you see, lights, everything, will be connected in a few years from now, right? Businesses have to adapt, right? If we do not, in the business world, uh, respond to the reality that consumers expect things differently and engage with the world in a different way, we're going to miss out on enormous opportunities. And my mobile, mobile, mobile. This, this will become the portal into a massive number of services and experiences that will be delivered by all the technology that we've talked about today. So that's my main sort of Google presentation. I did want to spend a couple of minutes on this. I'm going to do the short version. I want to make sure there's plenty of time for Q&A. I know you guys need to leave, I think, at 1230. So I'm going to just focus on this one slide and not walk through the, the pages that come behind this. Um, I've been really fortunate. I've managed to lead, uh, lead so far a really interesting life between the, the flying that I've done, between the venture stuff, the McKinsey stuff, and, uh, and now the Google stuff. And so uh, it, it's caused me to reflect on what have I learned along the way. And I didn't come from a wealthy family. I, my parents didn't even like airplanes. Right? They were actually, despite not liking airplanes, willing to let me go do it. And so I've had a lot of things that have, that have come my way that um, I just wanted to share, just my, my views on, on sort of what are the key things that I've, I've learned. So, so one is passion, right? And this is, I think it's a little bit overused at times, but it really is around the value in knowing what lights you up, right? What gets you going? If you could do anything in the world that you wanted to do, what would that be? And how do you navigate your way through life, including your career, in a way that has that be as much a part of what you're doing as you can? I spent so much time, even at McKinsey, right? McKinsey got a lot of really bright, amazing people. But the number of people I found that, that had been kind of on autopilot, right? Parents said I go to this school. Parents said I go to that school. These are the professions that are acceptable. And they end up there, and a lot of them aren't very interesting, right? They're, they're nice and all, and they're super smart, but they're not really interesting. And they've kind of head, headed down a path that's not at all what they want. And I, I use McKinsey as an example, but I would see that at Microsoft and Cisco and a lot of these big companies I spent time at. And if I reflect back on myself, I managed to discover for me, it was flying, and it's been this golden thread through everything. And even though I don't fly for a living anymore, it's been a huge part of what got me where I am. And I think it's because people just like to be around people who are lit up. And it's hard to be lit up if you're not working on something that you actually find interesting and exciting. Um, courage. I think there's two parts of this. Um, one is around courage to have a point of view. One of the things I also notice as I travel through the world is there's a lot of people that aren't willing to speak up and offer their, their mind. And there's a lot of people that have a point of view that's not very, not very well informed. And so if they're willing to offer an ill-informed point of view, then you should be willing to offer your point of view too. And the people that I found did the, the poorest is, uh, were people who were quiet and didn't express their opinion. And that's one of the main things I learned at McKinsey is it's an amazing development experience where you learn to have the confidence and the courage to offer a point of view, even if you're 26 years old talking to a CEO of a company. And so, you know, as you head out into the world, think about that, because most of the time people are making it up as they go, right? And so you're every bit as entitled to make up your point of view as you, as, as you need to, right? And, and be a voice in the room. The other dimension of courage that has really helped me a lot is being willing to take a chance and follow that thing that lights you up. I had several of those. I was getting my master's degree in engineering. I was you know, I, I guess about six months into it, I went to a talk. It was by a physics professor by school year and an Alaska bush pilot by summer. And I came out of that talk going, wow, what an amazing experience that would be. And I just couldn't get it out of my mind. And about, I don't know, three or four weeks later, I went to my advisor and said, I want a leave of absence. I'm going to go up and go just take an airline flight to Alaska and go door to door and try to find a job. 
and I'm still technically on leave of absence. <laughs> I never went back. That was back in 1988. <laughs> Um, but you know that even leaving McKinsey, I had a great thing going at McKinsey. This opportunity at Google came along, and I've always had a, a kind of a sense in my mind is, you know, running towards something, not away from something. And so I'm the biggest fan of someone who comes to me and says, "Wow, I've really found something that inspires me. I want to go do it." And as long as they're not going to do it because they're tired of what they're doing now and they're inspired by what they're going to go do, I say more power to you because every time I've done that, it's worked out amazingly well. Uh, role models. Nobody gets to where they are without people helping them. I had a, you know, dozens of people along the way that I can think of that played a huge part in my journey, both through life as well as through my career. Uh, and you can be intentional about this. When I think about, you know, where do I want to be in five years or 10 years, I look out in the world and I say, who's doing interesting things, right? Who, who's someone who seems to have crafted a life that inspires them, that, that I could see myself doing? They have a style that's like mine. They, ha they have accomplished things that I admire. And how do I get to know them? And, I've reached out to a lot of interesting people. Um, some of them no-name people you'd never know, other ones very well-known names. And I'm surprised at how often they respond and say they'd be more than happy to spend time and talk and share their learnings. And I think you'll find that, right? People are willing to invest time to help, help another person be successful. Um, balance, uh, a bit of a provocative view, I think, on this one. There is no such thing as balance. We, we spend a lot of time talking about work-life balance. And balance implies what you see in that picture, which is everything's like the state of equilibrium. My experience has been that everything is always kind of off balance. And so it's more a matter of how are you constantly correcting. And you know, I guess the simple way I'll, I'll articulate that, because I was wrestling a lot with this at McKinsey, because you're working sometimes 80 plus hours a week and traveling. I realized that all of us have 168 hours in the week, right? No matter who you are, you have 168 hours in the week. And so I took the time to block out those 168 hours in a way that said, what would the ideal week look like? How much time? I had basically health, happiness, uh, and uh, what was the first? basically it was, it was the family side of it. Health was how much time do I want to spend eating, sleeping, exercising. Happiness was my me time. For me, it was how much time do I want to spend flying or doing golf. Whatever I wanted to do is all about me. And then, then the third one was really the family time, time with my wife, my kids, my, my parents, any other relationships. And then I had the whole work side, which takes up the rest. And basically everything you do fits into that 168 hours. And why that was helpful for me is most of the time I was not doing what those blocks said, but it was really easy to see where I was off. If I was not sleeping enough, I'd stop doing the things that were fun to me. And that was a great grounding point because I started being less depressed that I wasn't leading a balanced life and more intentional about making sure that when I wasn't balanced, I was correcting back towards what that optimal looked like. And it, for me at least, turned out to be a very powerful um, mechanism to help make sure I led a really balanced life. And I've, I do a lot of really fun things. I do work hard and I travel a lot, but I also keep all my hobbies going and spend a lot of time with friends and family. Uh, and then lastly, Zen. Um, this could also be called Make Lemonade. Uh, there's a lot of things that, that go wrong. Um, and the short version of this, this uh, thought is, I was here at, uh, at Anderson. I wanted, when I first came in, I, I wanted to be an airline pilot more than anything. Well, they were all laying people off and that wasn't gonna happen. Uh, I then wanted to go work for a Fortune 500 company more than anything, because I thought my prior experience really had nothing of relevance to that. And I would come to Anderson and I would get hired by somebody with a global footprint. And um, I wanted to get on with Chevron, because I had all this Alaska experience. I could not get Chevron to give me an interview for the life of me. I tried over and over and they would not give me an interview. I then went and I interviewed with McKinsey, made it to the second round, ding, did not get hired by McKinsey. Uh, about seven months prior to all of that happening, I had been walking down a hall of the old building, run into a, another woman classmate, and she had said, we should be uh, co-chairs of first year orientation. And I said, no, we shouldn't. <laughs> Why would I want to do that, right? 300 people, it's scary, it's gonna be a lot of work. And, she ended up convincing me to try out for it. There were eight, people, eight couples interviewing for it. I said, I'll go do the interviews. I'm sure we won't make it. I'll be off the hook. We made it. We were selected as chairs of first year orientation. And that ended up being an amazing experience for the summer. Fast forward now to interviews. I've gotten dinged by A.T. Carney, dinged by McKinsey. Chevron wouldn't even talk to me. Airlines aren't hiring. The head of the Western area for Arthur D. Little comes in. He's got a full slate of interviews. I didn't know what Arthur D. Little was. It was a consulting company, but I didn't know them. And he goes and has lunch with the dean of students and says, hey, my lunch is open. Who's the one person I should have lunch with? And Eric Mockover's fellow's name, he says, you should have lunch with Darren Pleasance. 
And so sure enough, I end up having lunch with this guy. Next day I get a phone call, says, hey, we'd like to hire you. I end up with a consulting job in Massachusetts, in Cambridge, awesome. Two and a half years later, McKinsey calls back and they said, hey, we've kind of been following you and just want to know, do you have different experience? Because I wasn't that relevant to them as a pilot that had flown on glaciers and things like that. And this one I had two and a half years of consulting experience. So McKinsey interviewed me again. I got a job, went to McKinsey, thought I'd do it for two years, did it for 15. So that was, you know, I had a lot of those things if I look back on my life where it felt like really bad things were happening and all of a sudden something good came out of it. And so I would just leave you with that kind of concept of Zen. You never know at the moment whether the fact that it feels like it's bad may in fact be the best thing for you. I'm really happy, nothing against Chevron, but I'm really happy I didn't get hired by Chevron because <laughs> it just turned out really good. And so, um, so I hope, you know, I, I, we could talk for an hour on these topics because I'm really passionate about them. They've really affected the, the life I've managed to lead so far. So I realize we only have a few minutes left, so I want to give a few minutes for questions, and I'll stay afterwards uh, a bit here as well. So I will, uh, I will conclude my talk. Uh, I'm gonna, this will just flip through because I have, thank you guys. I realize that was a fast journey through a lot of stuff. Uh, questions? At the very back, yes. Yeah, so questions around uh, Google's approach to artificial intelligence and robotics. Um, I'm sure I don't know all of it, because uh, it's a big place, um, but you know, we absolutely are continuing to invest in that, the self-driving car. I mean, all of those use the same technologies. I suspect our purchase uh, several years ago of Boston Dynamics was to acquire a lot of the intelligence and IP that goes with building robots. And if any of you have seen the videos of Boston Dynamics, those robots are pretty amazing. I also know that Google does not want to be associated with the military and with some of the applications that those that that company was pursuing. And so my hypothesis is that's a major reason. It really isn't consistent with the brand. The, the AI and all that is very consistent with the brand, but the uh, other aspects of that are not. So I think that's why we're di uh, divesting it. Question here, here, here. I'll come back. So you talked about consumer trends changing in terms of the devices they're using and also how much video is being created and consumed. Do you think marketing wise, there might be a point where people are more susceptible to video marketing and the scale of, say, YouTube video marketing will be at the scale of AdWords? Um, yeah, or, or in, in place of television, is that what you're asking too? Or are you saying, it will, will it basically start to eclipse some of the traditional media like television? Uh, I, I, more so in terms of within Google, AdWords is a pretty big chunk of revenue, right? Do you ever see video revenue from marketing? Oh, I think so. Yeah, I mean, if you actually look at it, the. YouTube video revenues today are about 5% of total television revenues, and the reality, you know, it's a, it's a perfect complement to television because it's much more targetable. Uh, a lot of people watch TV and then are online watching complementary content. And so I think, yes, I think that's, that's a big bet of Google's is that, that YouTube will in fact be a, a, major, uh, a major, I'll call it complement to uh, other, other uh, media like television. Much bigger than it is today, and I think a much bigger revenue stream than it is today. Uh, down here, there was a question. Using virtual reality, and it's an amazing experience, the total immersion, the 350 area. But we find the Google Glass is very, very uh, ineffective. And so we've been using some of the systems like Oculus, and, but we want to expand into a space because today with the three, three and a half billion internet connected devices and the growth of the mobile apps, I was wondering what the uh, Google relationship could be with an enterprise like ours that is a global platform for live streaming using a mobile app. Google is a, is a platform company, so it, it largely looks to enable millions of people around the world to take advantage of, the, of that platform. So I would think you know, virtual reality is relatively nascent for us at this point. And we have Google Cardboard that I showed, and there's a lot of investments going on there, but it's still fairly new. So I would think that over the next three to five years, we'll see a, a major uptick in and how it gets used. You know, Google Glass is out there. That's more of an augmented reality world versus virtual reality. The two are kind of complementary, and that's getting a whole redesign right now. That'll be launched again here very shortly. And so I think you'll see Google creating more and more of a platform for companies like the one you just described to, to take advantage of that, right, and really, really build on the power of virtual reality. Thank you, guys. I appreciate it. Thank you so much for this very inspiring talk.